Last month during a worship service, we did a group visioning exercise. During the service, everyone was asked to reflect on two questions and to write answers to those two questions on the note cards that were provided. The first question asked was, if the Community Church of Chapel Hill didn't exist, why would it be necessary to create it? We received about 200 written responses, and of those responses, community emerged as one of the most common themes. We'd like to read you a few of the responses to the question we received from members of this congregation. Why am I here? Community. What do I want in the community church experience? Connection. Friends, community members sharing common core values, being part of a larger community, opportunities to participate in activities, just to get out of the house and do something. We'd need to create it so I could have my first chosen experience of spiritual community, a place I belong, a place to meet my true love, a place for a child to grow up knowing he or she is perfect as is, a place to be. When I first moved to Chapel Hill, I was alone and lonely because I had no friends or family here. As soon as I walked through the doors of community church, I felt as though I was home. Since then, my dearest friends are fellow members of the church, and most of my social activities revolve around church events or with fellow church members. When we moved to Chapel Hill, we shopped to find an appropriate church environment. I'm not sure what an appropriate church environment would be. When we finally found the community church, we found our home. I'm sure we aren't alone in finding this place of comfort and all home means. I need a place to find the warmth, love, and caring that comes from it. A place to laugh, cry, and learn together with different age groups. Too often, life in the United States is lived according to the doctrine of individualism, but church teaches us how to be in community. There would not be anywhere else that I could go and bring my family, nowhere for us to all go to seek community without another purpose that precedes simply coming together to share in a tolerant and respectful environment to enrich our souls. I realize that tolerance and respect are presuppositions. Call me an optimist. Connection, multi-generational community, spiritual community, a community of acceptance for children and youth, a community of diverse beliefs, a community serving the community, a place to get to know others, a place where I am known. There's a pattern. Come this morning as we deepen our understanding of community. Come, let us worship together. The words for the lighting of the chalice are found in your order of service. Please read with me if you wish to do so. Leave aside the little thoughts that distract you. For this place, like all places, is a holy place and now, like all times, is a holy time. Join with this community of seekers, and together, let us find. Please uh, stand as you are willing and able, and join in singing the opening hymn, number 347.
Welcome to the Community Church of Chapel Hill, Unitarian Universalist. I am Eric Conrad, a member of the Worship Associates Ministry here at the church. I especially want to welcome any visitors or newcomers to this church and to call your attention to the special note for you, welcome guests and newcomers at the bottom of the back side of the order of service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you arrived at this beloved place, you are welcome here. At this time, I'd like to ask any guests or newcomers who feel comfortable doing so to stand, wave your hand, tell us your name and where you're from so we can greet you after the service. Before you do, though, somebody will be coming around with a microphone so we'll be able to hear you. Uh, Is there anybody over here on, uh, on my left? How about on the right side of the hall? No visitors, okay. Well, or at least none who want to admit it. Uh, (laughs) Would the members of the uh, welcoming team who are here this morning please stand so our visitors may see who you are? So if you're secretly hiding visitors, look for these people. Visitors, these folks are wearing purple badges to make it easier for you to find them. They would love to talk with you, so please seek them out after the service during coffee hour over in the Jones Building. So the Jones Building is on the other side of the uh, complex. If you haven't done so, please turn off cell phones, pagers, and other noise-making devices. We have a uh, stewardship testimonial from uh, Maureen O'Rourke. My name is Maureen O'Rourke. I'm a member of this church, and I'm also chairperson of the annual Pledge Drive. In March of 2015, Shannon and I were married in the Community Church of Chapel Hill by Reverend Tom, and many of you were present to witness our wedding. Oh, happy day. What a celebration. Looking out at all of you who came will remain in my heart forever. When Shannon and I arrived in Chapel Hill in the fall of 2009, we were intent in finding community. The community church is our coming home. Love, gratitude, and generosity are the words I use in describing what this church means to me. Entry into this holy place puts a smile on my face, for this is where I want to be every Sunday, to feel the love. I have gratitude that I have found you, and the giving keeps giving, going back and forth, and will continue to do so. Shannon and I are staying. This is where we want to be. We want to keep the garden growing. How does one put a dollar amount to love and gratitude? Generosity. The idea of pledging is new to me. How much should I pledge? I make $24,000 a year. I am in good health. Car is paid for, no dependents. My half of the mortgage is $421, and I live in Chatham County. In fiscal year 2016-2017, Shannon and I together are pledging $2,000. We want to do our share, to make a contribution that says, thanks for being here. Thank you for offering me this beautiful sanctuary. Thank you for the fellowship in the Jones Building And thank you, Tom, and the welcoming committee for your outreach to folks who are discovering our church. We want to plant seeds of gratitude to our staff for their time, energy, and effort, to plant seeds to ensure the amazing programs offered by our church community continue. Fiddler on the Roof, the gala last night, that's community, that's music, That's people coming together. That's sacrifices. That's our church. 
So yes, dear folks, I am urging you to pledge generously to our church. Let us grow our garden by compensating our staff, providing monies so our ministries can continue to move us. Our church is healthy, thriving, and vibrant. So let us give thanks to what we have by giving generously to the church that gives so much to us. Let us make our garden grow. And in an ending, Shannon says, ditto. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Maureen asked me to just say a few words of logistics, although it's hard to follow that. Um, so after the service today, our, one of the themes of the stewardship drive is, is, is growing our garden, and one of our covenant groups um, will hand out little seed packets with, with wildflower seeds so that you can make your garden grow, literally. Um, out in the commons afterwards, make sure you stop by the tables and visit the various, um, the various ministries and groups of the church have set up tables, and so you can see um, some of the different, uh, this week and the next four weeks, you can see um, all of the different work of the church and the, that your pledges support. And then uh, during coffee hour, please go and stop by the uh, stop by the stewardship table and sign up for a cottage meeting. These meetings will be really fun um, and lively gatherings. And I've been asked to especially um, ask you if you uh, are, need child care or if getting a ride on an evening is hard, make sure to sign up for one of the Sunday afternoon ones that on the 6th and the 13th of March, there will be cottage meetings um, right here in the sanctuary and in the commons right following uh, the service or not long after. So sign up, check out the fair, get your flowers, and we'll uh, have our musical presentation. Would you please join with me in a time of spoken and silent meditation? Dear spirit of life and love, source of our being and our becoming, Be with us now as we gather in community in the midst of great joys and in the midst of deep and profound sorrows. Help us in this time to face life with courage, with resolve. Help us to respond to life not by becoming hardened, but by becoming tender. Let the love that we feel in our hearts cause our hearts and our lives to break open. As we face the sorrows and the joys of our living, help us to respond with gratitude for this life. Let that gratitude empower us to move beyond the walls of this community, to work to build justice, and to bring healing and understanding to the world and its people. We pray these prayers and so many others surrounded by love, held by connection, and grateful for the life and world that holds us all. Won't you please be still with me for a few moments of silence together?
As we move from silent to sung meditation, you'll find the words of our meditation, our sung meditation, inside your order of service. It is the Taize song, Ubi Caritas, words in Latin, Ubi Caritas et Amor, Ubi Caritas Deus Ibi Est, which means where charity and love abound, there God is. Won't you, we'll sing it through three times. The reading this morning we, we learned in the first service is a little bit of a tearjerker. Um, it's from the meditation manual, Walking Towards Morning, by UU Minister Reverend Victoria Safford. Um, it's a reading that's, that's always deeply touched me, and um, I think it articulates some principle about community just as, just as well as I think anybody can. And so I invite you to listen as I read, Why Do You Come, John? I knew a man once who came to church every single Sunday. You may find nothing remarkable in this, but think of it. He came every single Sunday, and it was not that he lacked other things to do. I knew him only in the last years of his life, a birthright Unitarian, a retired geologist who, when he was not at church, was a volunteer for Amnesty International, for the local food bank, for the American Civil Liberties Union, for the Family Planning Clinic, the AIDS Project, for the Unitarian Universalist District we were a part of, for the Audubon Society, and for a splendid community chorus. He was busier than any of us still holding full-time jobs. He was committed effective, clear about what he could and would and by his own standards should contribute to the causes he cared for. But what set him apart from all of us was that he came every single Sunday. And because of hearing loss, I think, more than any sense of his own importance, he sat in the front row. Why do you come, John? I asked him. In all kinds of weather, when you're well and when you're not, when you like the guest speaker, and when you know you won't. Why do you come every Sunday? I asked him this not long before he died. His answer was straightforward, just like the man himself. I come, he said, because somebody might miss me if I didn't. He said it in a way not arrogant at all, but generously and honestly, he was the kind of person who saw it as his duty and his privilege to welcome newcomers on Sunday morning, not because he needed more friends. The man was 80 years old with a lifetime of friends and colleagues and acquaintances to spare. He had plenty of friends already, more than he could handle, in fact. 
He did it not because he wanted to evangelize the visitors or grow the church. On the contrary, he loved and missed the tiny fellowship he'd joined in 1955. He felt a little lost with so many new faces, a little sad at all the changes. He greeted people as they came and steered them toward the minister, the coffee pot, the Sunday school, the guest book, the pledge cards, the sign-up sheets, because he felt it was the right and only thing to do. When people come into your community, you welcome them as if nothing in that moment matters more. He worked hard on Sunday mornings. He got up on Sunday expecting to work hard to make others feel at home. He came with that in mind, and he was right. After he died, we missed him when he didn't come. We missed him so very much. And do you know what happened? The Sunday after his memorial service, someone new, who'd never met John and now would never have the chance, walked right in and sat down in his empty place in that front row. A whole family just sat right down as if they owned the place, as if they had every right to be there, as if we were glad to see them. Two women new to town and their toddler and their baby, they came hoping there was room. And John, John would have been delighted. Eric's going to announce the offertory in just a second, um, and, and Eric's going to play for us um, this morning, he is giving us the world debut of a, uh, of a piece that he wrote where he takes words, uh, words of welcome that we read each week and um, has set them to music. Thank you, Eric, for sharing your gifts with us this morning. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> So the, the title of my sermon this morning is Wherever Two or Three Are Gathered. Pop quiz. Does anyone know where that line comes from? Yeah, where does it come from? <laughs> uh, uh, you, you raise your... Uh, no, okay. Anybody want to raise their... Anybody want to raise... Uh, I'm gonna, I, I call on you. Anybody want to shout it out? Jesus, the Bible, the New Testament. Yeah, you got it. You got it. So in the first service, we got... I got Peter, Paul, and Mary, um, which, and, and, not the, and, not, and not the biblical Peter, Paul, and Mary, the, the folk music one. Um, so you're right, wherever, wherever two or three are gathered is a phrase spoken by Jesus. You'll find it in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and I want to give you a little context surrounding this passage. Um, this chapter contains a number of teachings and parables about community. Matthew 18 contains <clears throat> the story that Jesus tells about the shepherd leaving the 99 sheep in order to find the one lost sheep. In Matthew 18, Jesus offers words of instruction about what you do when you have conflict with someone in community. Um, and the chapter also includes Jesus' teachings on forgiveness and a parable known as the parable of the unforgiving servant that is equal parts fascinating and disturbing, and a parable that deals with the subject of, of forgiveness and mercy. And right there in the midst of Matthew 18, in the midst of all of those instructions and teachings and stories and admonitions and parables about how to be together in community, there is the title of my sermon, the words of Jesus, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. And I want you to pay attention to what this passage doesn't say. It doesn't say, wherever a nation is gathered in my name, I am there. And it also doesn't say, wherever a single solitary individual believer is there in my name, I am there. It says wherever two or three or four are gathered, I'm there. So let me attempt to paraphrase. I wonder if this is what Jesus means. Jesus, I wonder if he's saying that my presence can only be felt and experienced in community. My message is meant to be lived in community. What I call the kingdom of God is truly a community eth ethos. And so if you want to experience the message I'm proclaiming, You'll need to be a part of a beloved community. I wonder if that is the message, wherever two or three are gathered. 
I think it is really <clears throat> the same for Unitarian Universalism. Most, if not all, of our seven principles only mean anything as far as they're practiced in community. We're told to honor each person's worth and dignity, to practice justice and equity in human relations, to accept one another and encourage one another to growth. We're told to observe the democratic process, keep before us a goal of world community, honor the interdependent web. In fact, even our UU principle urging us to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning has a social component. Our professors and researchers and public intellectuals understand that advanced scholarship is no longer solitary work, that scientific breakthroughs are accomplished in teams, and responsibility means being subjected to peer review. We arrive at new understandings through discourse in community. So what are we to make out of that passage in Matthew, that the spirit of Jesus is present whenever people gather in community? I think it raises an interesting question. For us, it raises a question, which is, is it possible to be a Unitarian Universalist alone? Is it possible to be a UU alone? Remember Thomas Jefferson famously wrote that since there was no Unitarian church at Charlottesville, he must be content to, quote, be a Unitarian by myself. But I wonder if that's possible. I actually have my doubts. Um, and for that matter, why would anyone want to? At the beginning of the service, Eric and I took turns reading reflections from those in our church community, answering the question, if this church didn't exist, why would we need to create it? And it was telling, it was telling that as I read through those 200 cards, that nobody said we would need to create this church for the promulgation of our correct Unitarian Universalist doctrine. <laughs> this is, this is, it's not to spread some doctrinal truth, but lots and lots and lots of people said that we would need to create this church because there is a deep and very real need for the distinctive form of community that we practice. The cards that people wrote carried messages like, this is one of the few places in my life where I can go as an atheist and feel valued. This is a place I can bring my genderqueer child and know that they'll be fully embraced. This is a place where a couple who comes from di different religious backgrounds can come and where both will be fully welcomed and neither will have to feel as though they've had to give up part of themselves. There's something precious and sacred in this type of community. There's a book um, that I like a lot. It's uh, um, by an author named Donald Miller. It's a book called Blue Like Jazz. Um, Donald Miller is an evangelical Christian but his book is a spiritual memoir about the time he spent sort of living in a thoroughly non-Christian community and about how that experience, how that experience of community actually in his own thinking made him a better Christian, which is an interesting type of book to read. Um, and he writes this passage about a college-aged teenager he meets named Nathan. And here is, Nathan is, is socially awkward. He wears a cape. Um, he speaks with a speech impediment that makes his voice sound like Daffy Duck. But here is what Donald Miller writes about community. I never thought of that community as an immoral place because someone like Nathan can go there and nobody will ever make fun of him. And if Nathan were to go to my church, which I love and would give my life for, I would fear, I would fear that he'd be made fun of behind his back. Nobody would bother to find out that he is a genius. He belongs to a community where what you are on the surface does not define you, does not label you, and that is what I love about this community because there is a foundational understanding that other people exist and they are important. To me, that's what authentic community means. It means people can bring their full selves, faults and foibles, quirks and idiosyncrasies, and find ourselves fully welcomed as we are. As Eric sang, you are welcome here. Alas, at the same time that we talk about the glories of community, it's also easy. There is another side. It's easy 
for people to grow a little cynical about community. What's that line from Sartre? Hell is other people. (laughs) So I want to confess to a little bit of edginess here. Um, I have this tendency, for me, um, that that line of Jesus's that I that I uh, that I shared with you, the, the wherever two or three are gathered, um, it's actually a little mantra that I sometimes say um, in a sarcastic way when I get annoyed with other people. So I'm, and, and this is this is this is confessional here. So I'll be at the movies. And somebody is sitting in the seat right in front of me will be playing with kind of the bright screen of their, their iPhone. Do you know what I'm talking about? And I'll say to myself, oh, wherever two or three are gathered, somebody's doing that. Or when I'm at the playground with my daughter and two kids start fighting, you know, I hope it's not mine, but often it is, um, and, and crying about who gets the swing Wherever two or three children are gathered, some child will cry because the other child has the swing first. You see, for all of the glorious and beautiful and sublime things that we say about community, that we write on cards about community, there is another truth as well, which is that community is hard and it's challenging and it's messy. To paraphrase one of my old mentors, community challenges me to be a better person than I really want to be. That's because the spiritual practice of community requires us, first and foremost, to step out of our own self-centeredness. Author David Foster Wallace once wrote, Everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I'm the absolute center of the universe, the realest, most vivid, and important person in existence. And spiritual community challenges this notion, and it should, because community brings us into a shared existence with other people, with their needs and concerns and interests and attitudes and viewpoints and sensitivities and bruises and wounds. And if you enter community with that kind of pre-Copernican mindset that I am the fixed center of the universe, things are probably not going to work out very well for you. So in community, we learn not to get our way all the time. We learn to play well with others. We learn to compromise. It's perhaps no coincidence, I think, that the, that the, that the, decline, the decline in civic institutions in American society that sociologist Robert Putnam detailed so thoroughly and the decline in religious participation that the Pew Study and others have chronicled has also this this decline, this decline in community has coincided with a coarsening of our politics, with gridlock and obstruction, and with people who assume that not only are they the center of the universe, but there is nothing else beyond them. And so it is that the liberation that community offers is only partially the liberation of acceptance and affirmation, though that is real, But it's also a liberation from selfishness and self-centeredness. It offers us a liberation from smallness and pettiness. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. Whenever two or three are gathered, that is where community is. And the liberation and the blessing that accompanies it. The words for extinguishing the chalice are found in your order of service. Please join with me in reading them. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please join hands and uh, sing sing shalom. Thank mm-hmm. you.